This is the story of a man that managed to stay completely under the radar for a long time. While no one was paying attention to him, he managed to grow his business and soon enough found himself in the Champions League of the Underworld. But did he get too big for his own good? This is the story of Samir Scarface Boyakshiran, a man that deserves to have his interesting story told that is filled with triumphs, big mistakes and the highest form of betrayal. Samir Bouyakshiran grew up in a working class neighborhood in Amsterdam West together with his parents, two brothers and two sisters. He was a smart kid with a good ability to learn. He did so at the Fonts Vitae Lyceum School in Amsterdam South. It is unclear how old he is exactly, as there are two contradicting statements. The community page of his old school said that he was born on the 22nd of April 1980. Another source states 1979 as his birth year. As he grew up, it remained relatively quiet in regard to him, as there is only one picture of him on the internet. He was not someone who kept getting in trouble with the law and was arrested now and then. What is known is that he already was aware of the fact that keeping a low profile would suit him best. In his teens, he is involved in petty crimes and is slowly gearing towards a career in the underworld, but nothing major yet. It was not until much later that his name popped up. It was an event that would literally scar him for life and would be the reason he named himself Scarface. While partying in Club Escape in Amsterdam one night, he gets into an argument with someone. A scuffle ensues and his opponent grabs a glass and pushes it in his face. Samir is left with a big scar underneath his right eye and a bit above his eyebrow. After this incident, he decided to adopt the suiting name Scarface. With this name, he was more than ready to take over the entire smuggling business in the Netherlands. Samir was well liked and special guy. To many, he was the son-in-law you would hope for. To others, he was a stone cold businessman that was not to be messed with at all. And he was always a step ahead. The exact date as to when he would officially enter the underworld remains unknown. What is known is that through his friendships with other known criminals in Amsterdam, such as Gwinnett Martha, he managed to build a pretty impressive network. Like I said, Samir was well liked, so he used this to his advantage to solidify a spot among the top criminals in Amsterdam fairly easy. He starts chipping in on shipments and slowly but surely builds his way up to be involved in bigger shipments. It wasn't until something interesting happened that would propel his career entirely. In 2003, Samir's name gets attached to the unsolved hit on Jemmy Nascento. Jemmy was a smuggler himself and was in the works of bringing in a shipment of 1,100 kilo coke. On the 4th of April 2003, Jemmy is struck on Drostelan in Rotterdam. A suspect was apprehended but later released due to the lack of evidence. This meant that all of a sudden, there was a shipment of 1,100 kilos that was arriving and needed to be sold. Samir, among others, got tied to this hit because he is the one who went to Colombia and told the cartel responsible for the shipments that he would sell it for them now that their original contact is gone. Somehow, he managed them to agree. And all of a sudden, he was one of the big players. This put him in direct contact with the source and it was only up from here. If you want concrete evidence that Samir was a serious player in the coke business, Samir was one of the very few smugglers in the Netherlands that was allowed to have his own stamp on the bricks of coke. Having your own stamp on these bricks is a sign of being a top dog, which he now was. The following years, Samir then made a smart decision and laid low for a long while. He was not one to splurge his money in Amsterdam in the clubs or expensive stores and get all eyes on him. Samir did the exact opposite. He was already way too big for Amsterdam and he had nothing more to prove. He moved and now lived between Dubai and Malaga. In both cities, he bought a lot of properties while also simultaneously still bringing in large shipments of coke in the ports of Antwerp and Rotterdam. At this point, he was unstoppable. His direct link to the Colombians was stronger than ever and he always managed to sell the shipments fast and do good business. They trusted him greatly. It was not until 2008 that he popped up on the radar again. He registered himself in Spain as a real estate investor, most likely to come across as a legit businessman for the government. It was not until the 14th of July 2010 
that Samir would get in serious trouble for the first time. 400 cookies, as they would be referred to in PGB messages, went missing off Samir's shipment. It was supposedly stolen by John Herbels, a traveller from Breda. 400 kilos was absolute pocket change to Samir, but he felt the need to send out a message. Don't play with him. It was one of the first times that he had to do so, and he wanted to do it right. But he absolutely did not expect this to happen. John wanted to pay. However, he needed extra time. Samir wanted to speed up the process and sent a group of English men to John's house to apply a bit of pressure. They knocked, they kicked, but no one opened. The group thought nobody was in the house. They still needed to bring across the message, so one of them decides to fire his weapon and shoot at the house. Little did he know was that John's son, Danny, was sitting behind the computer and his mum was also in the living room. John was already in bed. Those bullets that were fired went right through the house, hitting Danny and his mother. Danny is struck fatally and the mother is slightly injured. This was absolutely not Samir's intention. What was his fault is that he hired someone known to be a hothead and do reckless stuff. This man was the one who thought it would be a good idea to fire those shots, Alistair. The mission was to apply pressure and scare John into pain. It was absolutely not to take his son's life. Samir was apprehended for this incident when he flew from Dubai to Spain, but released shortly after as he had a good alibi. Prosecutors tried to depict him as one of the shooters, but his alibi was clear and bulletproof. He was in Spain at the time of this happening. Samir had his highest ranked man mediate between the two camps, and since then, nothing has been heard of it again. What did happen was that many people in the underworld despised Samir for what happened and stopped dealing with him. How could he, someone who sells so much, to do that to someone innocent over a shipment of just 400 kilos? Samir never faced any serious repercussions for the loss of Danny Hubbles. He basically went on about his business and took off where he left off. It was not until October 2012 that something vital to Samir's life story would happen. Najeb Bubu gets liquidated in Antwerp on the 18th of 2012. This was the event that would be the start of the Mokro War, a war that has been raging on for over a decade in the Netherlands and has caused a lot of tragedy, and to this day still does. What happened to Najeb was caused by a dispute over a missing shipment of 200 kilos. Samir did not have anything to do with this, to a man with his stature, a shipment of just 200 kilos is something he would look down upon and was not really worth his time. But what did have something to do with him is how the loss of Najeb shook up the entire playing field. Najeb was Gwinnett Martha's right-hand man and confidant. Gwinnett was one of the major players in Amsterdam and that time. Shortly after what happened to Najeb, Gwinnett was jailed for planning a retaliation on the man who took out Najeb. This left Gwinnett's group without a leader. Here is where Najib Ziggy Himish comes into the picture. A man that will have a crucial and very questionable role in what is about to happen to Samir. Ziggy deserves a video on his own, which will come. Stay tuned. Ziggy was Gwinnett's man when it came to some chores here and there, but he wanted to do more than that. Gwinnett allowed him to take care of business while he was in jail. This caused Ziggy to come in contact with Samir. Samir in his turn liked Ziggy's work ethic and slowly but surely made him part of his group. Ziggy did not want to be Gwinnett's man to take care of the small stuff anymore. He wanted to join the big boys. Unfortunately, as you may know, you cannot be part of two camps. In the underworld, it is either one or the other. Ziggy could not remain loyal to both Gwinnett and Samir, which put him in tough situations. He had to choose, serve Samir or Gwinnett. Mistrust starts building among the three camps, as Ziggy sometimes refuses to do jobs for Gwinnett and Samir, as he knows that whatever he does, it would hurt one or the other. In May 2014, Gwinnett gets his life taken. Was this Ziggy's work? This remains unknown. What is known is that any trust that was left was now long gone. Samir's group questioned Ziggy's loyalty. Did he get rid of Martha for us? Or are we next? Well, you tell me because what happens next is honestly insane. It is just past midnight on Thursday the 29th of August 2014 in Benahavis, Spain. 
Ziggy and Samir sit next to each other outside a cafe called All in One. They are joined by Nofel, another big smuggler from Amsterdam known for his ruthlessness. Samir spent time with them drinking. He came voluntarily, so he must have trusted the situation. Together they discussed business, nothing out of the ordinary. Until exactly 10 minutes to 2 at night, Ziggy puts his arm around Samir, and just a few seconds later, two armed men run towards the group. Samir notices something is wrong and tries to flee, but it is already too late. He is struck multiple times in his back and head. Did Ziggy really just do it again? Was it coincidence? Or was he now the initiator behind both Gwinnett and Samir's successful hits? The betrayal is once again very strong in this one. What was Nofel's part in this? Did they sell Samir out? Word on the street is that Samir got too big and powerful way too quickly and had to be taken out of the game. Ziggy and Nafel apparently sold Samir out to Rico the Chilean, but that remains unproven.